It is now February 25, week eight, and the class is MED 240, Pharmacology. Um, and what is due today, uh, week seven, study questions quiz, and discussion seven, right? And you can see this case question, and uh, they have some uh, questions here. Now, what are we doing this week? Uh, week eight, we're doing um, CNS drugs. And of course, this is due uh, next week. So I'm gonna click on this. Hey, and it works. Okay, last week we did psychiatric drugs, right? Psych, mind, right? Now we're doing central nervous system drugs and uh, the main, and remember what I mentioned last week, that a lot of the anti-epileptic or anti-seizure medication is, can also be used for antipsychotic and antidepressant. So it gets tricky. And when you start mixing uh, the same drug for different pathologies, you also can have mix and match um, uh, side effects. So um, epilepsy, also known as uh, seizure disorder, it's essentially what controls your movement. We already know from anatomy and physiology that your brain controls your movement, right? Brain then it goes to the descending track and then the motor. Now what happens if the brain is firing all over the place and not in a coordinated manner, then you'll get a seizure, okay? Which is right here, a disturbance of neuronal electrical activity. And it's not only gonna mess with, uh, of course, if it messes with brain function, it's definitely gonna mess with both sensory and motor and, and, and typically motor. So you get convulsions, okay? uncontrollable, uncoordinated muscle contractures, right? So what causes seizures? Well, there's an imbalance. Your body is always in balance between the excitatory and the inhibitory, right? And that's why I'm able to stay still. And we know why we're staying still because in reality, what's happening? My brain is sensing I'm moving a little bit to the right. My brain is sensing I'm moving a little bit to the left, right? What, are the, what does it do? It, it balances itself out. Oh. All right. So remember GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, that's an inhibitory, and uh, glutamate, glutamic acid, is excitatory. That's, uh, that's a nice example and a nice little quick review or uh, like a quick example of uh, what neurotransmitters can do. Now, if they're out of balance, you got too much excitatory or too little inhibitory, you're gonna get stuff like seizures. There's also enzymes that control neurotransmitter levels and we already know that. Remember your SNRIs and SSRIs? You mess with those enzymes that break down your neurotransmitters, you can, uh, you can have the neurotransmitter uh, in excessive amounts in your uh, synaptic gap or synaptic cleft. Another thing, right? We already talked about alcohol and DT, delirium tremens. Uh, if any of you ever known any uh, recovering alcoholics, you know when they don't get their alcohol, their daily dose, what happens? They start having the shakes, right? And that's the DTs. That's bad. That's when your, your, uh, your alcohol level is so high that your brain only likes being alcoholic. It doesn't like an alcohol-free environment and that's very dangerous. High fevers also are greater than 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not good, especially in uh, children. Hypo and hyperglycemia. Have any of you ever like not eaten for like a couple of days for whatever reason? Maybe you're sick or maybe you're really busy. By the way, we're in healthcare. There's gonna be days where you're gonna forget to eat. There's gonna be days where you're gonna forget to pee. Uh, yeah, you're so busy. You're like, why does my tummy hurt? Oh yeah. I haven't seen the inside of a bathroom in about a day or so. And, but that's also the beauty of our job. It, it, it gets that interesting that you, you forget to pee and eat. Of course, infection, meningitis. By the way, you look, look, look at the chart and you're in the ward, you see meningitis, don't hang out in that room, okay? Meningitis patients are usually highly infectious, do not hang out there. And of course, if you have a brain tumor, if um, if there's a tumor messing around with the electricity of your brain, that's gonna cause trouble. And of course, any head trauma, okay, or hematoma. So we can use this anti-seizure medication for a multitude of things and not only um, epilepsy. 
you have two kinds of seizures, partial and generalized. Um, um, eh, nice to know, uh, partial versus uh, uh, generalized. This is nice to know, but we're, remember, we're, we're a semi-clinical class. We're more interested in um, what medications, right? And what is the uh, mechanism of action? But just know that there's there's um, there's several types of uh, seizures, and the one that we're most um, familiar with is this tonic clonic, right? That are also known as grand mal seizures because back in the day, it's the French that uh, figured out these uh, classifications, and you also have absence, which is um, called petit mal. And mal, you know, means bad. Now, the difference between tonic-clonic and absence, right? Uh, the tonic-clonic is your classic seizure that you guys maybe have seen uh, uh, on TV or maybe even seen in real life. The person gets really rigid and then they fall down and they start shaking, right? And that's tonic-clonic. But absence is also uh, maybe, um, um, I played baseball probably a third of my life. And I remember in sixth grade, I had, a, um, I had a really good uh, pitcher and his name was Tico. One day he threw in a pitch and he just stood there on the mound, just stood there. So I threw the ball back and it just hit him in the chest and he just stood there. And then the whole game stopped because everyone's screaming at him like, pick up the ball, let's go play. And he just stood there. Well, guess what he was having? He was having an absence seizure. He checked out, right? And um, you know what? And then when I started remembering, he used to do that in class. Like, you would be like, hey, Teeks, you awake? Hey. And he'd come back and go, huh? Where are we? What are we doing? And I'm like, yeah, funny, funny. Uh, and all dumb. you do is think he's zoning out. And yeah, we always think he's zoning out until that game, that one game. He just stood there. And I'm like, haha, funny. I even walked out. He stood there so long. Me and the coach walked out to the mound. And he just stood there, wow. just looking at us, right? And that's a, that's a classic absence. Or they get, there's also variants of the absence where they sit there and then they look like they're sleeping. But a person, you start shaking them, they'll wake up, right? But of someone who's an absence seizure goes, it'll be very difficult to wake them up. And then when they wake them up, they'll be very confused. So when you have a patient that's um, going through a seizure, make sure that, especially tonic clonic, don't put anything in their mouth. Just make sure they, uh, go, they don't hit anything, especially their head, right? That's the best you can do. And then clear everybody out because when they wake up, everyone's peering over, hey, you okay? It's very embarrassing and it's very confusing. Just imagine you woke up and like eight people are staring down at you and you're wondering what, and then you have no recollection of the day. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. So that's, uh, I guess, uh, for, uh, you know, for our quiz, maybe for the, um, uh, for the quizzes that Dr. Cisco has, she might be, uh, she might uh, talk about this, but um, um, for my final, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really ask you the difference between uh, uh, the different kinds of seizures, because there, there are nuances to it, okay? Now, what's really bad is status epilepticus. Uh, if you hear, if you hear that, that person, unfortunately, will have seizures all day, every day. Um, and they're a candidate for surgery. Um, what we do in surgery is we do spinal surgery to actually shut down whole pathways, uh, whole motor pathways, so that the patient can uh, at least uh, lead a normal life. And this is rough uh, to watch. Uh, the several patients that I had were adolescents. Um, they were young. It was, it was rough. So now we know kind of what a seizure is, right? The anti-epileptic anti or anti-seizure medication, right, um, is, is designed to do what? Remember when we talked about gabapentin uh, earlier? Uh, it's done to quiet the brain. All the messages have to be what? Toned down so that, you know, all the unorganized uh, messages to the motor can stop. So we always start with monotherapy and just like your psychiatric medication, it takes like a month to kick in. Imagine you're having seizures and the doctor tells you it takes three, four, three to four weeks to kick in. And we start off with monotherapy, only one drug. Imagine thinking that, okay, I have one drug, it may or may not work. 
and I have to keep on taking this bad boy for another, for another month. So you could see how frustrating it is to our patient, right? So you got to get that to them from the get go. All right. Yeah, and then and also on top of that, you got a lot of crazy doctors and neurologists, and the neurologist is most likely the person you're going to see. But you know, um, um, you, you, doctors can they're all trained to do this. But if you have a significant seizure disorder, neurology is the per, is the per people you should be seeing, and also neurologists are. Um, uh, uh, psychoneurologists like my mother, who's both psychiatry and neurology, they can tell the difference if the seizures are, you know, alcohol related. Because uh, those of you, um, if any of you are exposed to any alcoholics, they're good liars. They're just like drug addicts. They're very, very good liars, and they're good at recovering, and and like uh, being good for a couple of weeks, and then they go back right to the behaviors. Um, so, um, I'm sorry. yeah. So with the different types seeing that like alcohol withdrawal or drug withdrawal or whatever, it, you're, you said your mother can see the difference in between. There's different kind of like... Yeah, there's different behaviors. And also, remember, psychiatry, what are, they re what are they really good at? They're not only good at giving you meds, they're good at um, psychotherapy. They're good at talking to you. I call it Jedi mind trick. They're good at just talking to you like you're a normal person. But then the next thing you know, wait a minute, I'm being psychoanalyzed. Look at the word psychoanalyze. Psycho, mind, ana, parts, lysis, break down. When my mother talks to you, she's not talking to you normally. She may, you may think it's a normal conversation, but she's picking you apart. And then when you leave the room, she starts saying stuff like, oh, she goes, she's got a little bit of OCD. Did you see what she was doing with her hands? She can't turn that stuff off. Most clinicians can't turn it off. It's funny because, uh, um, uh, every time uh, uh, me and the nurses, when we behind closed doors, we talk about you guys, a lot of the pathologies we see all day. Yeah. And we're like, oh my God, I have her. She goes, uh, goes, oh, do you see her? She has Duchenne's. And I'm like, I goes, yeah, I saw her in the hallway. He goes, yeah, what's she doing about that? <laughs> right? Because when you have a clinical eye, you can start seeing things. And I know it's not a very good ethical game, but me and my mother, when, when pre-COVID, when the malls were open, every, we would just play this game. Like uh, she would say, who in that table over here had a stroke? And then I'm like, I'm looking around. I don't know. There are all old people on that table. It could be anything. She goes, yeah, but one of them, because one of them is exhibiting signs. Can you pick it out? And we play this game. And now guess who she looped into this game? My daughter, because she's a nurse, right? So we, she sits there and we're like, my daughter will be walking around the table trying to see. And then, and then my, she, my mother would go, Lady on the left, facial palsy left, and he goes, look at her eye. And I'm looking right at it. And I'm like, no. And then I see her talk. She's got a little droop when she talks. And then I'm like, oh my God, how'd you see that from across the room? Remember, someone who's been practicing 48 years versus someone who's been practicing six, right? You, once you see things over and over and over again, and it brings me back to my message, that's how you guys should study. You, should, you guys should be studying every day for every class, just a little bit. Because repetition breeds what? Familiarity and more familiarity breeds expertise. That's why my mom acts like house. Because imagine seeing stuff for 48 years straight. Right? That's why goes that's why when my uh, my dad's brothers come in, my mom knows when they're doing stuff, when they've been drinking, when they've been doing things. All right. Uh, and it's just and that's why she's to the point when uh, my uncles come in the house, she leaves. Because she don't want trouble. And uh, my uncles, well, my uncle, he's the only surviving one left, right? He's trouble. Which, by the way, update, I don't know if I told you guys, uh, he almost got arrested because he, he uh, apparently uh, uh, punched, um, last year he punched a, a crossing guard in the throat uh, because he stated that the crossing guard accosted him while he was bringing my nephew to school. His nephew was late, and the guy put hands on him, and he thought he was in danger, and he punched the guy in the throat. Yeah, 82-year-old man punching uh, crossing guards in the throat. And that's alcoholism, alcoholism for you kids. Uh, it's ugly, and uh, even though he says he's all right, remember, use your clinical eye. Your patient will say they're all right all day, every day. But use, use your eye because um, this pharmacology thing is management. 
but all the other stuff we train you is subjective and objective and assessment before you do the plan, before you do the management. So here's some good stuff about AEDs, right? If something is good oral absorption, that means I have to, I have to eat it in pill form and good oral bioavailability, if you remember our first lecture, bioavailability is the uh, ability of the drug to stay in your system to go do work. So if it's swallowed, always think first pass effect. And first pass effect is metabolism of the liver. So um, uh, a lot of times uh, goes, when you eat this stuff, oral medications, your patient has to have a good liver. But then what am I giving AEDs for an alcoholic? How's their liver, right? It's awful. So now the doctor has to now adjust dose on how bad their liver function is. And also 20 year old Nelson had a pretty good liver. 50 year old Nelson, not so good. I don't want to know what 70 year old Nelson will look like, what my liver will look like. Okay. Even though I quit drinking three years ago, I had a good 48 some odd years of doing some damage. Well, not 48. Well, 48 minus 12. So what? 36 years. Right? And yes, I grew up in New York City. So yeah, I've been drinking since sixth grade. Well, I stopped. Yeah, it's rough. Um, people, um, inner city children usually uh, have greater exposure and uh, do things a lot earlier. So it, it, it predisposes them to what? All the bad. My kids who grew up in Fairfax, my daughter can't even look at alcohol. My 13 year old looks at alcohol as good. I can smell it from here. It's gross. And I'm like, yeah, but it tastes so good. I don't know. So let's look at some of these anti-convulsants drug lists. And, you'll, and let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me go through the really, really popular ones. Carbamazepine, also known as CBZ, right? Tegridol, that's clonazepam, clonopin. And you see clonazepam and diazepam. Wait a minute, I got to put that in my both A and B category, don't I? Right? Isn't that, uh, um, aren't those the ones that, well, uh, a sedative, you know, remember lorazepam, diazepam, uh, if you guys remember Valium, what happens when you take a Valium? Ooh, they're downers, right? Well, what do you think that will do to my brain? It will calm my brain down. So if I have a seizure, I take some Valium, boop, it'll calm everything down, yes? Oh, Depakote, really popular. Uh, Neurontin, oh, Gabapentin, also known as Neurontin, and remember, Neurontin is the proprietary name, the brand name. That's awesome stuff because we know that GABA, right? Gamma amino butyric acid is a what? Inhibitor. So gabapentin is good for a whole bunch of things. Um, psychotics, right? You have a psychotic ideation, right? You want to blow up the world? Give you gabapentin, guess what? I want to blow up the world, but you know, not today, right? And the same thing with really, really intractable seizures especially for adolescents, gabapentin is awesome. Also, and it goes antidepressant. They also use it for antidepressant. They use, gabapentin is one of those drugs that's all inclusive. They're not thinking of using it on low dose for people who are trying to lose weight, you know, so they can calm the, uh, the hunger centers in your brain. There's now new stuff that, because I, um, my sister, I, I told you about my sister, she's like, uh, she's like class two obese, Right, uh, she's getting to class one. She's moving, you know, to the to the world of the living like the rest of us, right? But um, they had her on gabapentin for a while, and I'm like, why? You got seizures? She goes, no. It flat. She goes, quote, it flattens me out so I can stay on my diet. And I go, how about Buspar or Bupropion? She goes, nah, I tried it, didn't work. Got, got the munchies like a month after. Get it? A month after because remember, a lot of these drugs, the psychotropic drugs and the anti-epileptics, take what months to work. So after a couple of months, my sister was already like, eh, right? And it's really, it, um, it's very interesting. One of these days, she won't allow, allow me, but uh, she'll get uh, very upset. I want to show you guys a picture of what she looked like when she was 20, when she was an NCAA, uh, uh, NCAA star, uh, uh, starting forward for U Columbia University and what she looks now. It's, it's, it's just night and day and you're like, what happened? Well, you eat 10,000 calories a day since you were 15 because you're an athlete. Mm -hmm. What happens when it's all done? Right. When you no longer work out six hours, seven hours a day, 
So if you're using gabapentin to like overall calm you down, how can they have the focus on that part of your brain that like aids? That's the funny part because gabapentin, since it's um, inhibitory, yeah. it inhibits a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And they found out about five years ago that it also inhibits, um, um, uh, if you recall, uh, your anatomy and physiology, the satiety centers. Um, and you know, the satiety is, is the center in your brain that tells you you're full, right? And connected to that is the, the centers of your brain that tells you that you're hungry. Now, what if I had something that will, will quiet that, those parts down? Then you don't want to eat. Right. And it's better than taking an amphetamine because an amphetamine will mess with your heart. Do you see the, you see the things that I got to go through on a daily that, basis? I that, like I got to play that. with side effects yeah. versus the good things that will do for you. Yeah. Like I would, if you're, if you're already class two obese, which is, you know, the people, class two is not quite 600 pound life. That's class three. That's when you're seeing bariatrics and that's, well, you, in class two, you should see bariatrics. Class one is me. I'm a good, what, 50 pounds overweight, but I can still run, I can still move. I can still kind of pick up things on the floor. Right, I got to do like, yeah, okay, I'm going. Right, because the guts in the way. But my sister's class two. She already has what? Uh, remember, I, I shared with you guys, Pickwickian syndrome. When your tummy is so big and so heavy, it's pushing up against your lungs, and then you get asthma-like effects. My sister, if she has to chase her son, before when she was at her heaviest, uh, she was 350 at one time. When she had to go run after her son when she was around 350, 320, she used to get these wheezing asthma attacks. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me go, let me go get uh, uh, a little mic. Now that she's gotten down to the realm of the 200s, right? She says 280, but I'll believe it when I see it, right? <laughs> I, I hear her when, uh, when I'm on the phone with her. She can now chase after her son because she's now what? 60 pounds lighter, but still, She'd be like, oh, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute. And then, but she can still, she can now catch up to him because you guys know a toddler, they're fast. Right. Oh, uh, my kid made it to the highway the other day oh my goodness. and I, and I'm a runner. And he goes, and he only, he only had like 20 yards ahead of me. And me and my daughter were both runners and uh, he made it all the way to the middle of the street uh, from the backyard. Right. So now we just, uh, uh, that's why before I used to make fun of, uh, before when I used to have kids, I used to make fun of parents who had kids on a leash. No, no, they're the smart ones, right? <laughs> there he goes, they're the smart ones because I, men. I had one for my daughter and when we used to go to the mall, yeah. I used to. Drink yeah, but people look at you, right? Who and who, 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 No, I, no, I don't care what, what you do, but when you step up to my face, then that is a problem. That's why I don't like going out. Well, that's a, that's entirely, let me get back to, let me get back to the lecture because I, I am now going off topic. Sorry, gang. Like, you know, that kid's like, did it go out and run here? And you're like, no. Nope. So I feel like that's better parenting. So because uh, I, I digress, like I usually do. My last question. For yep, the shoot. So with the gabapentin, sorry, I keep stuff on this. I'm just wondering, will it inhibit you from wanting to exercise if you're constantly? No, because I guess actually because uh, exercise works a different way, yeah. right? Because uh, uh, um, if you say overall, I'm thinking, oh, it's just going to. Because we we down. we don't know the exact location in your brain regarding motivation, okay. right? Because if we did, we'd zap that button a million times over. And gabapentin is it's just like penicillin. Okay. We didn't really know what it is. All we know is like. If you had a bad, you know, if you had a bad cough, I give you penicillin and it went away. Right. But it took 20 years to figure out, oh, wait a minute, this is what it does, right? And gabapentin is one of those drugs for the last uh, 30 years that it's like a catch-all. Yeah. And you'll see it. Now, the thing about gabapentin is it's crazy expensive. Uh -huh. It's like $300 a bottle. Okay. And the bottle will last you um, like uh, roughly uh, uh, less than a month. Yeah. So um, I remember when I was an outpatient, there was patients who really needed it, but they just didn't have the money. And then we have to give them these other drugs. Um, and, and you could see lorazepam, diazepam, clonazepam, right? Clonopin, Valium, and Ativan. Those are what? Uh, those are the benzodiazepines that we talked about last week that quiet everything down. And we could also use them as what? Sedatives. So that's one way to get your convulsions down. I could give you a sedative. Um, uh, phenobarbital, really popular, phenytoin, really popular, and uh, valproic acid, 
which is depakine. Now, if you look at phenobarbital, phen phenytoin, and valproic acid, they are, they look, if you looked at them chemically, they look like neurotransmitters. And it, doesn't that make sense? That if you because want to control your brain, and the way your brain communicates with itself is in, through neurotransmitters, what can I do? I can make drugs that look like what? Neurotransmitters. So your drug, so your brain can now picking up on what the neurotransmitter wants it to do. Unfortunately, that's also the bad thing about drugs, right? Remember we talked about uh, like cocaine and heroin? Yeah. They love dopamine receptors. Actually, your dopamine receptors after a while, especially with crack cocaine, will like the cocaine better than it likes the norepinephrine. It's unfortunate. And the affinity, remember how sticky uh, something is? Um, the affinity for cocaine and crack cocaine was one of those things like, let's make cocaine, but let's make it cheaper. While they were making cheaper, they made it more sticky or a greater affinity towards your uh, norepinephrine and dopamine receptor. And that's very, very dangerous. I'm happy that crack cocaine has fallen by the wayside, but guess who, guess who replaced it? Heroin. And heroin has a, has a decent affinity towards uh, uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. And that's why you get that euphoric feeling, that high feeling, the happy feeling. Right, but um, remember what I mentioned last uh, last lecture. You can do the same thing by working out. It won't be as uh, powerful or potent. Um, if anybody on the call or anybody in the class here has ever experienced a runner's high, you know you're working out, and then do you ever feel like really happy or giggly, right? And then it kicks in, and you're like, or you look at yourself in the mirror, right? And I know the gym mirrors aren't real, but I look in the mirror last night, and I was like, I had a good workout. You know, I, I had the sweat going and then you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, look at that arm. Yeah. And you get all, that's not really you. That's what? That's all the endorphins. That's the dopamine. And that's the uh, epinephrine from you working out, pumping you up, right? And making you feel great. And, uh, um, and that's the kind of thing that keeps me going because honestly, I hate the treadmill. Uh, it's very, very boring. And I'm, I don't know about you guys, I'm tired of music. There's like no more good new music or even the old music. I'm tired of it all. Yeah, I want to, I don't know. Maybe I'll start listening to like, I don't know, Buddhist monks with triangles. Who knows? That'll be for next week. So <laughs> let's look at carbamazepine and let's look at some of their mechanisms of actions. Because remember, we have to, carbamazepine was one of, Tegretol is one of the most uh, common things. So what do they do? Sodium channels. Now that makes sense because didn't we learn in anatomy and physiology that sodium channels uh, or gated sodium channels is the thing that sparks electricity, especially in our heart and calcium as well? Yep. So if I take the sodium channel and I block it, right? Don't you think I'll also block a seizure? Sure. Right. But there could be some serious side effects like anemia uh, and agranulocytosis. And you know, granulocytes are your red, white blood cells. So yeah, uh, you could have some, a uh, little bit of immunocompromised state. That's why we monitor the blood levels of Tegretol on a regular basis. Clonopin, right? Again, depresses the nerve transition and it's really good. And this is a nice prophylaxis. And remember what a prophylactic drug is. Prophylaxis is we give it before the problem happens, hence the prefix pro. So. The first sign that there's trouble in a seizure, especially with a grand mal uh, tonic-clonic seizure is, it's something called aura. The patient kind of knows something's about to happen. And it would be a change in sensorium. Like for example, I had a patient, she once was complaining at me. She's like, Dr. Graz, it's not fair that everybody in the ward gets blueberry pancakes. I could smell it and I don't find it nice that you, uh, you let everyone get blueberry pancakes except me. And then the next thing happened, what happened? She went into a seizure. I didn't put it together until when, uh, because I, I, when I was writing my notes, I'm like, she was complaining about blueberry pancakes. Man, this is the Bronx. You, do you think we're gonna give you blueberry pancakes? You're lucky if you get food, all right? Uh, so I was, I was in a state hospital at the time. So then you put it together, she had aura. Then, then it made me as a clinician start paying attention, right? Um, others, uh, they see a bright light, 
I had another patient of mine right before she went into uh, an Absom seizure. She was talking to um, the Archangel Gabriel in Spanish. And I'm like, is she talking to, who's Gabriel? And, I go, and she was looking up. And the next thing I know, she checked out, uh -oh. right? And I'm like, oh, right? I was in the Department of Neurology and that's an aura. So it could be a taste, smell, a sight, or the patient goes, something's wrong, right? Then, you know, eyes up, pay attention. And we have that, we can give you, uh, uh, we can give you clonopin, okay? Or we can give you a benzo. I mean, we, another benzo. So it all varies between each patient. Yeah, and remember, this is like, um, this is an, like an introductory class for you guys. The management, I think there's more advanced things, of course, because I know you guys have questions like, yeah, but how do you do that? When do you, when do you do that? Remember, everything in the hospital has a protocol. So, and there are preparatory steps for every patient just in case. Now, gabapentin, neurontin. Remember I told you that? That's the catch-all, right? Um, it says doesn't prevent primary stages, but according to my mother, it does everything. Uh, look at this. I goes, there's some uh, fatigue, uh, sleepiness, weight gain, but it's, it's not bad, right? And we use it for a whole bunch of uh, neurologic disorders, even neurologic pain. Uh, I told you guys a story about my patient with trigeminal neuralgia, he used to pull out his teeth, that farmer dude who pulled out all his teeth. No lie, he only had like three teeth left in his head. So every time he had a really bad jaw pain, he'd pull out a tooth, even though the tooth was fine. And he did this for years, it was cool. When he should have had what? Gabapentin, kept all his teeth. Lamictal, block sodium channels. Hey, do you see a, a theme here, right? Blocking something that has an excitatory function, right? Phenytoin, dilantin, right? Promotes sodium outflow from cells. So again, blocking sodium. Do you guys see a pattern here, right? So lump all the ones that have similar mechanisms of action and then uh, you guys should be good for the final. And they got a lot of side effects, right? But the one that I don't like is this peripheral neuropathy. Now, uh, peripheral neuropathy is um, your fingers and toes, you're gonna start having weird sensorium, like um, it's called paresthesias, or you get pins and needles for no reason, or you get clumsy. Um, a lot of diabetic patients have diabetic neuropathies and peripheral neuropathies. Watch a diabetic. If you have any diabetics in your family, watch them eat. Every meal, they're, something's going to fall out of their mouth or they're going to drop a spoon or fork. Every meal. Because they, if you have neuropathy, pathy, disease, and the nerves in your fingers and toes don't work too well, how coordinated is your, your, your fine motor skills? Not very, right? Um, um, I watch my father-in-law eat and uh, he has uncontrolled diabetes. Stuff's falling out of his mouth, right? And he's drooling all over himself, right? He's already, what, 83, right? And um, uh, my mother's the same age. She has pre-diabetes, but does anything fall out of her mouth? Does she have any problems with her hands other than um, arthritis? No. If you live a certain way, and uh, my father-in-law lived just like the rest of the girl, like um, at least my side of the family. He was a drinker, he was a smoker, didn't take care of his weight. So he gets to live a hard life in his 80s. And my mother, since she doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, always exercises her brain. You know, even this morning while she's waiting for the bus, she's still reading neurological journals. You believe that? All right, I'm like, and he goes, I don't wanna read when I get home. I, mean, I'm, I guess that's why, who knows, maybe I'll be seen out when I'm 60. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Lyrica, you may, uh, you may see this, uh, it's uh, relatively new in the last uh, maybe 10, 15 years, and it, it's just like gabapentin. But it's controlled substance, but you know, it's not too bad. Because remember, controlled substance, schedule twos and threes, those are the ones you pay attention to. Uh, Gabitrol, just like GABA. Uh, Topamax, again, block sodium channels, right? He goes, and if you block a sodium channel, what will it also do? It'll increase your GABA. So doesn't that look like a beautiful question? What is the majority of most anti-seizure medications? They will block sodium or enhance GABA. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? If I wanna be broad about it. Parkinson's, now 
Um, now, we already know that, and it says glutamate for excitatory, but what do we like? We like enhancing the inhibitory. You enhance GABA, you enhance the inhibitory, which is blocking sodium channels. You could see the majority of the seizure medication does that, and it'll quiet everything down in the brain. Now, you know glutamate or glutamic acid, right, is excitatory uh, because remember the story I told you guys about um, Chinese food? When you eat it, even when it's not good, oh, this is good, right? It gets you really pumped up. And then an hour later, what happens? You're hungry still. And then you get a headache. Why? I get sleepy. Yeah, or you get so full, you get sleepy. What, what did they do? He goes, uh, someone put a bunch of salt that has glutamate in it, made you excitatory, made you want to eat, but then what? He goes, it, it, goes it, not, it zonked you out, and then now you're hungry again. Now you're back to square one. Uh, what's Parkinson's? Now, Parkinson's is a, um, a disease of motion, which just is like a seizure, right? So don't you think a lot of these seizure medications can do the same thing for Parkinson's? And that's, um, uh, um, I love Michael J. Fox. I love uh, uh, Back to the Future. And uh, I've, been, um, I've been watching a lot on uh, Hulu. Like, um, if, uh, if you remember him in the 80s, well, most of you weren't even born, right? Uh, uh, there's a show, Family Ties, where he played uh, 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 Michael Keaton, if you guys remember that. Yeah. Well, he now has Parkinson's, and he has, uh, well, he calls it shaky dad disease. And you could see him on TV. He can't stop shaking even though he's on meds. Yeah, but what, he did it for a while. Yeah, and he hit it for, but you know what's funny? Mm -hmm. When he was playing that mayor, when he already was diagnosed with it, my mom took one look and went, and he goes, is he on drugs? And I'm like, mom, because my mother has, a, has, the, uh, has the typical, uh, she watches a lot of TV just like me. She has the typical, um, like everybody in Hollywood is a drug addict. So she was looking at Michael J. Fox, and I also noticed he was moving a little funny, but I'm not a neurologist, but I'm like, eh, whatever. Maybe, you know, maybe that's his thing, or I don't know. Maybe he's on drugs, right? Well, my mom goes, he's on drugs. And then, then we discovered, you know, months later, oh, he's got Parkinson's. And then my mom goes, oh, that explains it. Because he has tremors and uh, dystonia, which is abnormal tone. Um, akinesia, which is the absence of, uh, of smooth movement. Now, uh, you guys know that, you, you know, when you move your hand around, it's kind of smooth, isn't it? But if it looks like, you know, your webcam is glitching, right, but you're not looking at somebody in a webcam, you're looking at them live, that's, uh, that's Parkinson's. Another thing you can also notice, look at their handwriting, right? Yeah, I had an uncle who died from Parkinson's. Yeah, you probably saw his handwriting. It was sloppy. Then it got, it goes, then, it, then you can't even tell what it is. And then they can't even hold a pencil. Yeah, you can see it's progressive. And he didn't even take medication for it. He just oh, like paper. That's it a rough. Like he was in his 70s when he first started. Yeah, and that's also another thing. Imagine you're shaking all day, all day, even when you sleep, how debilitating this is. So you could see because it goes, uh, it's part of uh, the basal ganglia which uh, in your brain, it controls all the smooth motor. So that's why when you write or you know, when you move around, you move smoothly. But if you have rigidity or you have, uh, and uh, remember I said, always look at your patient, look at the way they walk, look at the way they talk. They could have a shuffling gait. You see a lot of old people, like uh, uh, the, way, the way they walk, they shuffle around, right? They don't pick up their feet. They don't pick up their feet because they can't control it. They can't control when the feet, when when the foot leaves the ground, it'll start shaking, and then they'll be um, out of out of balance. So they tend to keep both of their feet on the ground. I wish I could show you guys at home, but it's, but you could also look it up on YouTube. It's like this. Can you, you ever see old people? See them walk like this, like that, because if they try to pick up their foot off the ground, they'll be like, no, walk like that. If you ask them, pick your foot, foot pick your foot up to the ground, or if you see them how they walk upstairs, right? They get very very. I'm only in my 50s and I now hold the banister. I now have three points, both my feet on the ground and banister. I don't run upstairs anymore uh, um, because, you know, when you get older, when you get heavier, just, but just imagine you have 
a movement disorder like Parkinson's on top, right? So it's something to think about. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna start inhibiting things. And one way, and, um, but the uh, Parkinson's loves dopamine and uh, loves enhancing dopamine, which is an inhibitor. And maybe you saw that movie, uh, I forgot it had Robert De Niro in it, uh, something like Sleeping Awake or something like that when he woke up from Parkinson's and then, but then it's uh, relatively temporary. So just like seizures, what are we doing? But seizures, remember, think GABA, think sodium channels. But for Parkinson's, think what? Dopamine, right? Now, um, and also acetylcholine, I wanna block that because uh, you know that acetylcholine also deals with uh, um, uh, stimulation. So what's going on, right? There's not enough dopamine in your system. And also, by the way, we also know that dopamine is also related to depression, right? If you don't have enough dopamine. So on top of, you're already depressed about having this, this movement disorder. On top of that, the dopamine is now making you what? Depressed, right? So these are the things that we have to consider. So we, there is no cure, unfortunately. What do we try to do? We try to get what is called palliation or deal with the patient's symptomatic relief. And the really popular ones, um, I like cinnamon, uh, levodopa, carbidopa, uh, and uh, cogentin, uh, benzotrine, uh, benzotropine, right? Uh, those to me are the more popular ones. Yeah, uh, especially these combos, which is uh, levodopa, which is a, a, ter a certain type of, they call it L-dopa, right? Because uh, they said L or levo or uh, because it, it, it's, a, it's a chemistry name. So um, the thing about anything that has dopamine is it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's hard to cross the blood-brain barrier because the function of the blood-brain barrier is to keep what? Because the brain is sterile. You don't want anything crossing that that doesn't need to cross. Like what needs to cross? Oxygen, glucose, because we need that stuff, the good stuff, right? But if I'm trying to put another chemical in there, your brain doesn't like it. So, so it'll, block, everything it'll block it out. So if you give levodopa or any of the levodopa combinations, your brain won't absorb the majority of it, unfortunately, even at higher doses. It's just whoever built us, built us pretty darn good, right? Um, uh, so it's something to, it's something to consider um, because the, the brain is a very, very complex thing and it likes to protect itself and it likes to keep itself sterile, meaning no bacteria, no, nothing foreign. Um, what else could we say about anti-Parkinson's? Um, uh, just, uh, just that it'll focus on dopamine, on the inhibitory, right? So, and also, uh, what do you call it? Levodopa and Cinemet, which is a car, uh, which is a combo. And the combos like uh, Cinemet, they're done to kind of trick your brain into letting some of that dopamine in, right? But it kind of works. In, in, in my opinion, it's still, the, the blood-brain barrier is just a tough nut to crack uh, right now chemically. Now, what other central nervous uh, disorders that, uh, that also that we can use a lot of these medications on? Uh, we can use it for myasthenia gravis, and we talked about myasthenia gravis, autoimmune disease of the neuromuscular junction, Junction, it affects acetylcholine receptors. So I can use some of these uh, Parkinson's drugs on it because it messes with acetylcholine. Um, do, 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 do. Myasthenia gravis, think acetylcholine. So think acetylcholine esterase drugs. So if I have the ends, if I block the enzyme that makes acetyl, that, that breaks down acetylcholine, don't you think I'll have more acetylcholine, more excitatory? So my muscles will keep in motion. But in myasthenia gravis, when, it, when you run out of acetylcholine, what happens? You can't move your muscles and it's progressive. 
And uh, I believe I shared the story with you, one of my classmates. Eight o'clock in the morning, he said, he started yawning, he started feeling tired. Then he goes, oh, I'm gonna go home. By 10 a.m., he passed out in front of the hospital. Fortunately for him, uh, he couldn't even lift up his hands to hail a cab. And then by 12 noon, we intubated him and put him on a mechanical ventilator because he didn't have enough acetylcholine to move the muscles of his lungs. And a quick review of your muscles of your lungs that you need to use, that need to move, are your, of course, diaphragm and your intercostal muscles. What happens if I shut those down? If I don't have acetylcholine, you will die. And that's what happened. And this is the horrible part of it. He didn't have any insurance card on him and uh, they demanded cash. So my, the school, the medical school that he was enrolled in was willing to take him off vent. So all the classmates around 12 o'clock had to all get together and pull up cash because his parents lived, um, lived in Canada or something and they couldn't reach his parents at the time to send money. And, and isn't that crazy, right? So think about it, uh, the hospital is a business. They don't care if you're a student there, they don't care if you're on staff. Uh, you don't have insurance, you don't have money, uh, even in America. Do you believe that uh, some places we treat patients differently just because they don't have insurance? All, because all places will treat you. Now, let me, let me tell you why. As a physician, I, I, goes, I took the vow of doing what? Treating everybody. But let's look at it human, humanistically. What if you keep on seeing a Medicaid patient and you never get paid? After a while, what would you do? You'd have a hard time seeing them, wouldn't you? Because you have to pay off medical school. You have to pay off your mortgage. You have to pay off your kids, right? And my education cost eight times more than everyone else. So Medicaid pays me, but it does stuff like this. Like, uh, let's say I work on a Medicaid patient and the bill racks up to maybe $60. Out of that $60, you know how much I'll get paid? Like $5, $7. Oh, to this day, I still get checks from Medicaid. But um, uh, my wife figured it out. Uh, they still owe me like 70 grand. And I only was practicing six years. So how much, you can only imagine how much someone like my mother, who's been practicing for 45, 48 years, how much Medicaid owes me. So we usually trump, because uh, we usually turf, and turfing is horrible. It's when you move a patient to another, to another doctor or another, uh, but me, I try, if it's serious, I, of course, by law, I have to stabilize you. But beyond that, I find it because it, after a while, it was difficult, you know, as a human being. But, but then you're like, but what did we always teach you guys here? Ethics, what you should do. I mean, I don't like it. I know I'm not going to get paid, but what am I going to do? I will take care of you. And I will take care of you just as well as another patient. But it, it's, it, it's, it's hard. It's very hard. Because if you know that that I thought I was wrong, I asked another doctor, and he said, "No, every patient gets treated Liar. the same." And I said, "No, no, no they don't. That's not true because I seen it because I worked oh, yeah. in, in three different medical places before, and I I even over uh, I, I overheard doctors yeah. telling nurses or medical assistants just." schedule this patient only for less than 15 minutes in yeah. or or they get or if you're in the er you'll hear this he goes yeah get the pa to see him yeah. or get the first year a pgy which is a resident mm -hmm. your attending doesn't want to see them mm -hmm. like how many times when i was a, a pgy one i was working in bronx new york it's a you know it's a low-income place mm -hmm. it, it is what it is right and how many times dr tassin would tell me he goes yeah see the patient in one and i go she has she has a, a congestive heart failure you should see her doctor and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a first year and then he tells me are you telling me what to do and then i'm like uh, no sir i'll do it and then you go and you're trying your best but that person needs an attending mm -hmm. i'm 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 good but i'm a first year resident and, so, and the nurses are looking at me like do what you can and then or they're kind of rushing you to release them and also we're kind of rushing you to release you because i don't want you to incur any more charges and what I like to do when I was practicing, I had a list of all the, um, uh, uh, the places where you could get money. And I'd give them that handout. I'm like, you know what, go, go, go here. Don't stay here. You stay here, you're gonna get a lot of money. That's no good. So you gotta go now. Please sign, sign up, please. 
when I, when I was practicing, I tried to do that because it, it's very hard to see them, especially if you have a mechanical ventilator or if you need to go to ICU, how much trouble you're gonna get in. That's like thousands and thousands of dollars a day. My aunt, fortunately, uh, she, she just went for hypoglycemia and dizziness. She, she had a fainting spell. Um, the neurologic and uh, CT scan workup and all that came to 20 grand. But she has what? Um, uh, she not only has uh, uh, Medicare, she also has what? Um, um, insurance from her, her previous job. We were all thinking like, what if she didn't have all that? Mm -hmm. She'd be like in the street. They just give her, they just give her some of these meds, you know, maybe some Tylenol, have a nice day. Because they can't even get, remember gabapentin was very expensive. These, these meds, gabapentin is super, super expensive, but a lot of these other meds, they're relatively expensive. So um, make that a point, guys, to always adhere to your ethics. You treat the patient the best you can, but also you gotta look at the patient holistically, what, can, what they can afford and, uh, um, and, and, and what you can do for them and always have your backups. And, and that's why I'm such a, a proponent of working in an urban atmosphere uh, with uh, more low income patients because you get to see these other problems and you get to help uh, in ways that you wouldn't if you went to in like a nice place uh, or a, a, a nice facility or a not nice, but you know, you know what I'm saying? A, a facility that everyone has insurance and it's a suburban area. That's why I love um, urban settings uh, clinically. It's, 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 it's really beneficial and, and it's what we all signed on for, I hope. Uh, don't need to uh, memorize uh, the, uh, the drugs for myasthenia gravis because just memorize the what? The mechanism of action. They are an acetylcholinesterase drug. And here's some examples, right? Uh, now, ADHD. Uh, I am biased because uh, my mother converted me to her religion. Uh, my mother, again, neuropsychiatrist of 45 plus years, and her specialty is um, violent adolescents who are usually on drugs. And a lot of them have been uh, diagnosed with ADHD. Now, ADHD is a very, very difficult thing to diagnose because you don't know if they're being that way due to maybe uh, psychosis or other, uh, um, other uh, psychiatric disorders. It's, it's, it's really hard. And to make things worse, the DSM criteria, which is the criteria for psychiatric disorders, is vague. Um, so my mother and I have a... Um, have a hypothesis that the adult ADHD is actually masked psychosis or major depressive disorder, right? Uh, and ADHD for children, you shouldn't be giving these amphetamines for a child older than five or six years old, seven at the max. Because, because um, here's the theory, right? If you have attention deficit, remember your your homeostasis is like a seesaw, right? So if you're on teetering on one side, right? You're not paying attention. What happens if I give you some uppers? It's gonna move you where? On to the other side, right? It's gonna at least motivate you to, to pay more attention and, uh, and, uh, and to focus, yes? In theory. But the problem is the data states that it only works for ages of seven and under. But here's the funny thing then why a whole bunch of kids in my daughter's middle school class are on Adderall? You're just making an addict. And that's my, that's my mother's and my theory. And, and physiologically, it makes sense because it's an amphetamine. And a seven-year-old metabolism is very, very different than a 17-year-old, than a 21-year-old, than a 25-year-old, yes? We all know this. We had anatomy and physiology. But that's the... That's the thing about ADHD. And look, I'm gonna give you an amphetamine. That's a, that's a class two controlled substance. That's up there with what? Cocaine, I mean, well, cocaine's class one, but that's up there with Oxycontin, Toradol, right? Uh, Dilaudid. Man, you wanna give, you wanna give a 17 year old? Dilaudid or Oxy? Well, maybe if that's what they're into. But man, that's dangerous. And if you look at it medically, that's kind of dangerous. But if you give it low dose, especially for a younger child, it will, it will kind of help them focus. 
And I've seen some of my uh, mother's patients for the younger ones, like six, seven, eight, it works. But man, you guys all see what a 17 year old on Adderall looks like. They're not, that's not focused. That's somebody who's high, right? And that's the book that uh, my mother and I, well, my mother, she had the idea, but I'm trying to push it because I need to be published. I haven't been published in more than 10 years. And I, and as a person in academia, that's my new thing. I got to get published. So as the teenager is developing that really inhibits any kind of growth in the frontal lobe. Yeah. And also you are creating a what? An addict, yeah. right? Because it's a class, it's a class two controlled substance, right? That's like me giving you Dilaudid all day at low doses. But remember, what happens when you get addicted? You need more, you need more, you need more. And also, how many, uh, in New York City, how, in, in an urban center, how many kids are faking it? You know how much it is a pill? It's, it's a couple of bucks. And if I got like a, a 30 of them, I could sell it for what? Uh, 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 five, eight dollars a pill? Don't ask me how I know, right? And then you multiply by multiply that by 30. And all you have to do is say the magic words when you go to your psychiatrist. That's why it takes a good psychiatrist to see, all, see through all of that. And my, like I said, that's my mother's expertise. These kids like, oh, I'm not focused. That's why I get into fights. No, you get into fights because you're a jerk. You get into fights because you don't know how to control your emotion. So let's focus on controlling your emotion instead of giving you Adderall, right? Um, uh, so but that's, but just know for the exam, ADHD, what do we like? Amphetamine derivative, but low dose, and it's more recommended towards a younger child. And ADHD, just because your child's a jerk, that doesn't mean they're ADHD. But if they're walking around, they can't eat, they're, they're destructive, everything they touch, they'll burn, they'll break, they'll do everything, and um, they have issues sleeping and all these other things then that's something that you should bring it to the psychologist or the psychiatrist, right? Not because Johnny doesn't pay attention in math class. They used to say that about my daughter. They left her back in first grade because they said, you know, uh, just like me, I got left back in second grade because they said, oh, I have a learning disorder. Oh, I didn't see any doctor. My mother was arguing with the principal, but you know, you can't fight city hall. Uh, and we were relatively new immigrants, so no one wants to. You know, who's going to deal with the angry Filipino lady? Nobody, right? Even to this day, who's going to deal with that lady? Not me, right? Well, my daughter, they said, oh, she has ADHD. And I go, are you a psychiatrist? But then I learned my lesson from my mother. Don't fight them. You know what I did? I then started doing one-on-one -on -one teaching sessions on teaching my daughter on how to focus. Guess what now? Now she's in advanced everything. Now she's had straight A's just like her older sister all day, every day. That was me. My school said oh, I had to have, I was put into like the lower classes. Yeah. And then you ask them why? Yeah. Just because some teacher thinks that you're not paying attention. Exactly. Um, as a teacher, I have absolutely no medical training as a teacher. I have a license to teach in two states. I went through considerable training and nothing in that training states that you are a medical professional mm -hmm. to psychiatrically diagnose a child. And which, by the way, child psychiatry is very tricky. Remember, in psychiatry, we mentioned it last week, getting the uh, subjective, getting the story from your, uh, from your patient is very tricky. And it's very tricky for the adults because what do the adults like to do? Lie, right? Because isn't it easy now that I can Google, right? Um, attention, adult uh, attention deficit disorder. And then what do I do? When, when the psychiatrist calls me, you go, you know, I have trouble focusing and sometimes I sleep too much, sometimes I sleep too little, and then, then you could talk really fast like I do, right? If you look at me, you might think that I need Adderall, <laughs> right? Especially if I go off topic, and I go, oh man, this cat needs Adderall. No, I don't have ADHD, right? Teachers gotta be careful though, because they could probably get hit with some kind of fire. No, they don't, because they're not medical professionals. So if they leave a kid back, it's what? Oh, it's protocol, it's at the discretion, right? That's why, uh, that's why my mother said, leave it alone, she goes, do you remember all the trouble that my mother got in when she tried to get me out of, uh, of being left back in second grade? Mm -hmm. But my mother says, all you have to do is show them, show them up, show them. And fast forward, who got to go to medical school, right? Not everybody. Oh, in my entire, in my entire um, uh, high school class, uh, I asked around, 
uh, all these people who are, I'm going to pre-med, I'm going to this bad school and that bad school. You know how many doctors in my high school of 400 some odd kids? <laughs> Me, right? The kid they used to call Crazy 80. The kid that, that said, oh, this guy has mental problems. It's perfect, it's psychi psychiatry mom because he, this kid's mental. You know when you're in the Marine Corps and they call you Crazy Eddie or they call you Cheez-Its because you're, you're, because I used to eat Doritos like constantly because, and also my brain is full of holes, hence cheese, right? To this day, they'd like, you're not a doctor, really? You know what, how, um, how insulting that is from like my high school buddies and my Marine buddies? Like, no, seriously, you're not a doctor. You just say that, right? And I'm like, no, I went to medical school. I guess I have, because, I even show them and they go, you could get that on eBay. That's uh, uh, my good friend, a good friend of mine from high school. You could get that on eBay. I yeah, saw that. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, no. Right? So watch out when we're, we're looking at this. But for the exam, you could see common sense. It's amphetamine. It's kind of a little bit on the dangerous side. Oh, look at this. Look. Oh, you know dexmethylphenidate? You know how much that, that costs in the real world? Right? And look, Dextra gets double amphetamine. Amphetamine, amphetamine. That's what Adderall is. I totally forgot about that. It's amphetamine, amphetamine. So nice they named it twice. And twice, right? Schedule two. All of this is highly addictive. It's just as addictive as the allotted. Just as, you know, my wife was so scared. She had a lot of pain last night. She was so scared to take um, even uh, 2.5 milligrams of oxy. She was like, oh man, I'd rather just be in pain. And I'm like, no, you gotta take some of it. Here, take half a dose, and then in four hours, take the other half. You know what, she just dealt with the pain. She only took a half a dose, and she just dealt with the pain. Guess where she is right now? Working, right? Because, can, does INOVA shut down? Does administrative shut down? No. Clinical shut down? No one shuts down. Now, they have non-stimulants uh, for See, in theory, you're supposed to give a non-stimulant for six years and older, but there's a whole bunch of doctors, man. They just give whatever they want, right? Uh, so uh, you may have heard of Concerta as well, but again, mechanism action, but Adderall, woo! And look at Adderall, only lasts six hours. So this child, in, in theory, has to take three doses a day. That's a lot of amphetamine, man. That's not good. Oh, and oh, by the way, you know how they get them to sleep? You give them benzodiazepine, you give them Valium. So you're creating a drug addict. Uppers in the day and downers at night. Lovely. And, and, and we're wondering why, why all these high school kids, I, I chaperoned um, uh, um, uh, a high school trip to my detriment because all the, other, all the other parents were giving me guff. They were like, Nelson, we know you're really busy and all, but you know, you really should contribute more than, you know, more of your time. You know how like some of the parents who don't work and then uh, they, they get on the case of the parents who do work. So I gave in, I took a day off and um, I went on a boat trip with these lunatics. How many of them tried to jump off the boat for, for giggles? Are you um, talking about the kids or the adults? No, the, the adults were like, mm, I'm not touching the kid because they didn't want any you know, lawsuit. Me, I was screaming at kids. I was touching kids because I didn't want to go fish kids out of, I goes, uh, out of the Potomac, like right? How many of them, the poor, uh, the poor guy who was driving the boat, I want to touch the boat, I want to touch the boat, I want to drive the boat. Like five or six lunatics. And you're, you're going, what the? And then the bus came late. That made it worse. They were running all over the dock. And I'm, I, me and another parent were the only one, and he was a cop, and we were the only ones chasing kids down, like, hey, you, he goes, hey, you creep, stand, to the point where we had to line everybody up like they were in prison. And the no one moved. Like, oh, yeah, the other adults were like, um, I'm, you know, I'm just here to watch mine. And the other four ladies were just looking at us, and me and the cop guy were like, and me and the cop guy, we were on the bus, we were like, we're never doing this again. And then I'm like, thank goodness for COVID because I've never, because, and, and it's what? And, and, and the, that's, that's also part of the chapter that my mother half wrote. A lot of it, and my mother admits she wasn't the best parent. And also I admit I wasn't the best parent. My Duke exhibited ADHD qualities because why? After I got in therapy, which was court ordered by the way, 
because Duke got into a lot of fights and got kicked out of Fairfax County, you find out that the, a lot of the cause, it's not his fault. It was poor and improper parenting. And that's hard for a parent to admit because me and my wife are working all the time. Sometimes he gets shuffled off to grandma. Grandma lets him do whatever he wants. And he's in, he's in a family of quote unquote warriors, right? So we're like, oh, you punch the kid out? Good show. You put him down? All right, good. We're good to go. So is it surprising that a nine-year-old knows how to do a ranger chokehold? Mm -hmm. No, because I taught him. And then he'll use it. And that's what happened, right? And who's to blame? I can seriously, I can easily blame society or whatever, but ultimately I am to blame. I taught him how to do that. I taught him how, I guess, therefore he got into a lot of fights, right? I, I used to tell him things like, don't let anyone take your food, right? Because you know, kids, you know how kids are, right? Um, so he uh, knocked the kid out with a tray because he took a couple of tater tots. And I'm like, and at the time I'm like, well, he stole food, he deserves it. But then when you think about it, he's living in Fairfax. The kid probably did it as a joke. And okay, maybe the kid was maybe being a bully, but do you think that's the right way to tell your kid to deal with things? Well, if he grew up in the Bronx in 1970, yeah, you better act like that. It was like prison when I was a kid. But here is Fairfax, it's a different place, different time, different way to deal with people. And even then, even if the kid was being bullied and defending himself in school, no, my, my, my son was one of those kids that were. Like maybe the kid was mouthing off to him, but he didn't need to react in a physical manner. Right. Like if someone calls you something, just call them something back. And then you're even, right? You move on with your day. But Duke would be quiet. He'd let it, he'd let it brew. And then he goes, I don't get this guy in a day. When I was in school, I used to, you know, when people used to make fun of me because I didn't know a lot of English back then when I was like 12 or 13, you know, I came into this country. I was 6. Came into this country, I was six. And, and, and here's the thing, I speak Tagalog, but uh, in the Bronx, you don't speak Spanish, and Tagalog's kind of like Spanish, so I was able to at least speak some Spanish. If you don't speak Spanish, they're going to come down on you, and they're going to take your stuff. Yeah, I was going to make fun of homeschool kids. Oh, yeah. Remember, remember how we used to treat homeschool kids? We go, like, like, when homeschool kids came into high school, you know, because most of the parents were like, okay, maybe they're ready to come in. Right, because you know, many parents wanted to, you know, uh, maximize their education, and by the time they get to high school, you know, they, you know, they they need that social aspect, right? Well, uh, we used to we used to bully them a lot and like make fun of them, like, hey, what are you tarted? Nobody messed with me. I just I even the them. violent ones. Because, I thought back then they're just like, Ding. yeah, and then <laughs> and then, and it's also you need to bring your child to school to be bullied a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, so they can learn how to be assertive learn how to stand up for themselves. Because my kids who grew up in Fairfax, they are the nicest kids in the world. That makes them targets when they're in the world, right? But my two kids who grew up in the Philippines were real bullies, who had real bullies and people really trying to hurt them. Uh, when they came here in, uh, to the United States when they were uh, um, teenage, they can stand up to themselves. Oh, my Chanel, she's, she's, a, she's a nurse. Um, her nurse supervisor is very, very scary. You know what? They're best friends because Chanel can stand up to her and Chanel can be respectful at the same time. And, you know, and I talked to her and she goes, oh my gosh. And she goes, Dr. Grass, your daughter is like the best. I never heard, I never heard any supervisor talk about their, their newbie nurses like that. Then because why? Not because she's any special, because you work hard and you stick up for yourself and you stand up for yourself. And when you make a mistake, you say what? I did it. But many junior nurses like, mm, you know, they get a little scared or they cry. Oh, Chanel, I don't think, the last time I saw Chanel cry, she was a kid. I don't think she cries. I mean, she's, she's me times 10. Uh, but isn't that what you want as a nurse? Somebody conscientious, someone who doesn't sleep, someone who reads all the time, and someone who won't quit on you, right? right? Who won't get emotional. And that's my problem with my daughter. Like when I'm, when I'm happy and I want her to at least be a little bit emotional, she has that, you, you know, like the same thing with some of you may have tweens at home. They're like, yeah, whatever. Like this morning on, on the call, Shan, show me the baby. I don't feel like it. Um, yeah, he's, it's almost her bedtime. So, and I'm like, I'm your father. I'm telling you to get your, get my daughter and show me to her now. 
um, okay, I think grandma wants to talk to you. And then she hung up on me. <laughs> and then when she came back, she got around on the phone with her mother. She said, oh, I think we're having technical difficulty. Um, and then I'm like, oh, Chanel, she and I were bump heads all, she's my eldest. And now she just, now she decided I'm not going back to nursing. And I go, why? Um, because I'm going to medical school. Like as if I'm supposed to know, I'm taking my MCAT next month. Did mommy not tell you? And I'm like, cut the attitude. Why do you want to go to medical school? She goes, well, I could tell you a reason, but you'll probably try to talk me out of it. So I'm not going to tell you the reason. So this is how I talk with her all day. That's why I think she needs meds. <laughs> Multiple sclerosis. MS, autoimmune disease. So besides trying to boost up your immune system, what can I do for you, right? I can, uh, um, uh, I, I can give you a medication that will um, boost up the muscles. Just know the uh, mechanism of action of, um, of uh, drugs for, uh, for an autoimmune is to do what? Block the autoimmune reaction. Block whatever's attacking our immune system. And that's what uh, multiple sclerosis drugs do. When I told you my uh, cousin who has MS, she, when she got pregnant and had her first symptoms came out, she like was MS free for those nine months she was pregnant. Yeah, because yeah. remember what we talked about pregnancy? Mm -hmm. What happens in pregnancy? All your hormones and everything turn upside down, sometimes permanently, right? Because why? When you're pregnant, the physiology and the anatomy is everything for baby, mm -hmm. right? So everything gets all upside down. And that's why mommy has a really hard time mm -hmm. and uh, has a hard time adjusting mentally, physically, because why everything's, but once you understand, oh, everything's for baby. Oh, then you get it. Why am I anemic? Oh, because my baby's taking away some of my white blood cells. She was happy and healthy the whole pregnancy. Yeah, my wife had the whole spectrum. There are some pregnancies, like she wasn't even pregnant. Um, like with her last child, she was, uh, she was still doing full-time Zumba instructor uh 10 hours a week uh when she was already uh six months and i'm like and she did a marathon without telling me uh we uh my group does zumba marathons anywhere from three to four hours and since my wife you know she's the the lead she's there on stage all the time and i tell her you can't do that the baby's like baby's like he goes now you know why the little one's a psycho and doesn't go to sleep and bounces around all the time. Oh yeah, that's the one who ran in the street. That's the one where if you don't scratch his back, he'll kick you in the face until you scratch his back. He'll go scratch, scratch, scratch. And I'm like, go away, go away, scratch your own back. Right? And then he turns around, puts his butt on your chest and then proceeds to kick you in the face. And you're like, oh, right? But nah, it is what it is. Alzheimer's. Now, the thing about Alzheimer's, you already know from Alzheimer's, remember those neurofibrillary tangles, if you remember from anatomy and physiology, right? So Alzheimer's, there's no cure. And the only drug that we can have is denepazil, also known as Aricep. All it does is just improve your memory enough for about four to six months. My aunt uh, was a victim of Alzheimer's and she was good for four months, just enough to say goodbye to everybody just enough to, um, uh, uh, she went uh, on a world cruise just to see the world one last time before her mind went. Mm -hmm. And that was eight years ago. She is still alive and alive. she doesn't do anything. She just sits there and, uh, but the Aricept was good for four months. It, they say up to six months, but it improved the me uh, memory just in, enough. Uh, Cognex, eh, I don't like Cognex, but the drug of choice is the Nepazil, Aricept, and it's been the drug of choice for like 30 years. And that's Alzheimer's. And what does it do? It improves the memory just long enough so you can take care of business. So she was able to sell her practice. By the way, she was a physician. She was a pediatrician. And I, well, I always tell this story. Uh, she has two daughters who aren't doctors. She forgot their names first, but remembered mine. Because why? I'm her, I'm her favorite nephew who graduated medical school. So when I went to go see her, coincidentally, I was in California and I went to go see her. She was like, Dr. Grimes, did you prepare the charts today? And I'm like, ma'am, no. Oh, I, I need a chart review now. 
And then I'm like, damn. So we Googled up some charts and I had to present them. And um, my two cousins were just crying because she was like, why does she remember you? And they go, because I got a white coat on. She thinks I'm somebody else. They are but you know what? She called me by my right name. She's like, Dr. Garaz. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, because uh, um, Jasmine and Christine, we've been um, there. My aunt, I call her my aunt, but she's my mother's laboratory partner when they were in medical school. So me and her kids, when we all lived in Jersey and uh, the Bronx, we all grew up together, right? And it was rough seeing a woman who I know who was sharp as a tack, not know things. And then years later, I, I visit her. She's just staring. And then she has to be fed through a tube. And she's just, um, but the husband and the family are very Catholic. So they're not gonna, they're, they're not gonna take her off support. They're not gonna do any of that. They're just gonna keep her in that home for the, until the end of their days. And, and it's been like eight years now, plus, and it's hard. Yeah, well, I remember the day my grandmother said the next thing today. Uh, she's like, I don't have a granddaughter named Amanda, and that. that yeah, it hurts, because I'm, I'm, I was like, I was like, Auntie, he goes, look who's here, Chris and Jazz, and then I go, I don't know them. I goes, I need to do chart review. Do you understand me, Dr. Grice? He goes, Would you like to lose your position here? And I was like. Woo, I guess, and my mother's like this, she, you know, giving me the signal like, yeah, play along, play along. And, and also, so I can move around the hospital more freely, I grab the white coat, right? Uh, so I can see her chart, I can see, you, you know, it's a trick, yeah. uh, you, you do it at hospital. Oh, Inova works all the time. Oh, by the way, since my wife works for Inova, I have epic, uh, epic pass. So when the nurses don't shut down the screen, I can access your, their epic, which I did because I wanted to know, you know, stuff about my wife and all, all that stuff. Uh, no one's stopping me. There's a big red sticker that says visitor and I'm at a, I'm at a terminal in a hallway accessing my wife's records. Maybe they're all colorblind. No, <laughs> they just, they're just, they're probably tired. They're tired or they're busy or they're like, yeah, whatever. This guy knows what he's doing. How did he gain access or oh, whatever, right? Um, and my wife taught me a lot about Epic. So one of these days, uh, I, f I feel like uh, bringing that here to, to the campus because Epic is the main EMR here. So with that being said, that's all the lecture. Uh, it's at this point, all you guys playing at home, uh, do you guys have any questions? You could unmute and uh, if you don't have any questions or you could put a question in um, uh, the, the comment section, I am now going to uh, move my computer Okay, I'm gonna take it off. This I hope it doesn't mess anything up. Oh, no, we don't know. So I'm going to now turn on the lights, and then I'm gonna. If you guys give me like, a, uh, I'll give you guys like a little five minute break. In five minutes, I'm going to set up the injections and do a little quick mini uh, tutorial. And then those of us here on campus, if you uh, if you'd like, you could glove up, and then we can all. Um, we can all practice these three techniques, right? And we're not doing it, of course, on humans. We're doing it on these, these little simulator things. So let me turn on the lights. And hold this. Uh... So I'm not sharing the screen. Okay, here. All right, so we're gonna do, you guys can, maybe you can see here and I can set up right here. Okay, I'll see you guys in five. Those of you here on the ground, and uh, I will write down all the people who are here online. <laughs> yeah, but then it's cold, right? Yeah. That's about to crack. So be careful of that, especially when you guys practice. Monkeys. You guys online, you guys are still with me? In five, I see no real questions. So in five minutes, let me get some of the material. Let 
left cabinet, no. Right cabinet, no. Upper cabinet, yes. Oh, it'd be nice if you had a card. This thing that looks like a chicken cutlet. This is a, a, a simulator pad for intradermal and um, intramuscular. And you can see it's like soft. It kind of like stimulates uh, uh, skin, but I, it looks like a chicken cutlet to me, like a real fat chicken cutlet. So that's a, what we use uh, for simulation. Okay. Ooh, someone left a vial in here. A typical vial. Okay. We'll, we'll do another station for one of you. Let me get some of the different kinds of needles. Now, what's in here? We're using saline. NSS, 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Now, uh, back in the day, like eight, eight, maybe 10 years ago, we used to inject each other, but uh, uh, <laughs> something bad happened at Falls Church uh, where we had a contaminated vial and three students got, you know, just had a little rash, but that's enough for us to change our protocol to, and then we got these, and these things are kind of expensive. So um, this is better just to practice here. Now, Doing the injections, the parenteral injections, is kind of really important now because uh, 
um, well, how many vaccines are they going to get by June? What, 500, like uh, 300 million or something like that? Some ridiculous number, right? So when you guys, uh, when you guys go out, don't be surprised if you're going to be administering a whole bunch of injections. So knowing the skill set uh, is uh, pretty important. And let me show you just some types of uh, needles and syringes. So I got that. Let's get some. Oh, wow. So one day I want my seniors to be lazy and not lock everything. They locked everything. Yeah, we ran out of mediums, and then also nursing ran out of mediums too, so I couldn't steal from them last night. <laughs> and by steal, I mean procure and uh, replace. Just borrow it. Huh? Borrow. No, we do that. We're 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 a nice family here. Uh, we uh, quote unquote procure items from each other. There are days where things are missing from my lab, and uh, but uh, that's how cool we all are with each other. Now, as you can see here, here's a syringe, and you can read it. This is a 5cc or 5ml syringe. And by the color on these little caps, you can tell what gauge it is. Now for this particular one, this is a 20 gauge times one, which means uh, the hole is 20 gauge and the length is one inch. Okay, so that's for intramuscular. Now for subcutaneous and intradermal, we use these tuberculin syringes. See this? If you ever watch The Wire, huh? want to be a heroin addict? There you go. One of these. Well, I have to do it in context, right? <laughs> Even my thirteen-year-old watches a lot of a lot of really, uh, really unsavory movies. He says that's drug addict needle. That's for bad people. It's not bad people. They're not bad people. <laughs> uh, when my babies, I used to be in Call of Duty tournaments and they used to be right next to me watching the madness. <laughs> well, me, it's usually the kids try to touch the keyboard and I have to kind of kick them out because I'm usually losing. All right, so okay, I have that, 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 that. Okay. So gather around. I'm gonna do a demo. All right, and uh, if you guys have you guys already had uh, 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 your phlebotomy class or a a medic uh, a procedure class? Okay, good. So I can start from the very very. I mean, I had an intro one, but that one it because of the pandemic. Yeah. Man, like I tell you guys, like uh, pre-COVID, this particular class, since I have a lot of my, my lectures on video, mm -hmm. we do labs every day. Yeah. Right here, because that's what you guys pay for. You like, didn't pay for me yapping. Yeah. You, pay for, you pay for like playing with this stuff. So guys, you can be here or gather around. All right, everybody at home, hi, hello. Okay, again, this is a simulator. And let's go over. There are three techniques, and then I'll also have, I, I think I put a handout, if I haven't done that yet, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on, um, um, uh, on your Moodle, right? So you can see there are different kinds of, um, there, there are three, well, actually there are four parenteral uh, ways to do medication. Like the first one is IV, and we're not gonna do IV. Well, if you already know how to do phlebotomy, you already know how to put something in vein, right? But in phlebotomy, I'm taking blood out. But here, this is kind of, that's why we only do it on simulators because I'm now putting things in. So we're gonna pretend that this is a, oh, I forgot my other material. We're gonna pretend that it's not um, uh, sodium chloride solution we're putting in. We're putting in um, a, uh, a real medication. So just like our, our previous lecture, the medications have to be checked how many times? 
How many times have you checked meds? At least what? Four. Yeah. Right? Once when you get the med medication from the cabinet, then you check it against the, uh, the chart, the orders, right? Then when you place it down here, when you, before you load it, you check it. And then before you deliver it, you check it. And yes, get used to checking it that many times because honestly, how many times, especially when I was in a hurry, on the last check, I go, wait a minute. Remember your five rights? There could be a, uh, I'm checking for the right patient, the right dose, the right route of an administration, right? Uh, what's the other one? Uh, the right drug, of course. But what's the fifth right? And the right timing. So let's say, for example, the doctor said, hey, we got to do this uh, postprandial. Postprandial means what? After eating, right? So doesn't want the medication given or the injection given. It has to be given at a certain time. So you could see how, like, a lot of people think that, oh, like medical assisting, or like, I guess, oh, it's like a lowly. Yes, you're one of the lowest people on the totem pole, but the things you do require training. And the things you do require a lot of thought because these techniques that you learn now, if you learn it right, when you move on to nursing or medical school or whatever you want to move on to, they stay with you. A lot of the techniques that I teach now, especially in phlebotomy, I learned when I was in EMS. Medical school didn't teach me. Medical school says, here, you guys watch the video? Okay, good. There's 20 patients out there. Uh, can you do them before the next hour? And you'll be judged on it. That's medical school. And then the people who weren't clinical, they were like, what? I saw the video once. Well, okay, good, figure it out. And us who were clinical, we we're like, eh, eh, give me the equipment. Now, so when we set up our equipment, and this is our patient, right? The first thing we always do is, of course, just like phlebotomy, you always have to, again, do I have the right patient? Check the chart, right? You introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Nelson. I'm your technician today. The doctor wants me to give you a little bit of a vaccine, or they want to give me a test. Are you okay with it? And then they may ask, what is this for? And then we're going to talk about what each, each item is for, right? So uh, after you do that, once you get consent, then you, um, and then based on the chart that I, I'm going to give you, you have to find the proper location. And a proper location, you make sure the patient doesn't have any rashes or any open wounds or open sores or uh, any recent uh, tattoos or ink, okay? Because, you know, that's the... A tattoo gun is like fresh wounds and it's um, a potential for infection, right? Also, you don't want to mess up somebody's tattoo. It's expensive. No one wants to do that. So you can have a brand new vial like this, right? And it has the cap. Make sure the cap is sealed. And another thing you're going to check is expiration date. Because this is meds, right? It can, it can go bad. Now, let's say this one's new. I don't want to, I found one that what? The expiration is good, right? And, but the cap is off. The little metal part or a plastic part is off. So that means I should sterilize this. And what do I sterilize it with? 70% isopropyl alcohol, these one by one pads. So I'll do that. Now here's a trick. You can put it like this. The inside of this is sterile. And, um, uh, if I have to lay anything down on it, you could lay it back. But after you do that, you go whoop, and that will be one pad for this. And that's all you need to do. Just whoop, just like that. Because while this was in the refrigerator or wherever it was, don't you think dust and garbage or whatever might have settled down in there or any leftover drug from the previous needle? That's a problem. So I put that down. So the first um, technique we're going to talk about is intramuscular, right? Intra meaning within, muscular has to be the muscle. And we know from our anatomy and physiology, the muscle is deep, right? So I have my area. Since I'm poking a needle into your skin, that's gonna go all the way down. Don't you think there's bacteria and stuff here, right? So I'm going to have to do what with this area? Cleanse the area. Cleanse the area. And how do we do that? Just like, uh, uh, just like in phlebotomy, I find the area that I'm gonna do concentric circles, so it's nice and wide, so that I got it. And then put all this to the side, all right? So after I identified myself, after I cleansed this, right, then I can prepare my material because I can't poke this person until what? This is dry, so it's gonna take a few, right? So let's say I have an order for uh, whatever, how much, uh, two cc's, 
On this, this is a 5 cc or 5 ml syringe. CC is cubic centimeter, which is equal to the metric milliliter. So if you're ordered 5 cc's, what do you give? Right, and it says here ml. See, it even says here ml slash cc. Right? So now you know what a, a cc or an ml is. So intramuscular, if it's muscle, it has to go deep. So the angle of attack is what? Straight down. Okay? So if you're looking at this, this is the skin, right? You're going to go what? 90 degrees. Don't straight down. Now, I'm only going to take the cap off when I'm ready to rock and roll. And I'm not ready to rock and roll yet. And by the way, I forgot my shots. Fuck my shots. Book title. Book title. Position ammo. I should be fired. I had another dream that I won the lottery again, so I woke up thinking that I didn't have to go to work. No. I hate those. I was like, Nils, we can quit. And she was like, she goes, it's a dream. And I go, no, it happened. So, <laughs> no, I, I ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, just because, uh, just between us girls, uh, I got turned down again by another a large university uh, for uh, the dean's position. So, <sighs> oh well, you know, always a bridesmaid. What do you mean always a bridesmaid? I've been, uh, I, how many dean's positions did I have in my career already? Three? So, eh. Because I need the money because my baby girl wants to go to medical school. So, well, in medical school, what do you do? You check it. You remember, we're always checking the labels, not only for the right drug, right dose, and whatnot. You're checking to see if there's any instructions. Because sometimes you got to do what? Shake it. Right? Yeah. Sometimes you have to make sure it's refrigerated. And if this, this bad boy was laying out like that, Right, and this wasn't refrigerated. You pick it up; it's warm. Guess what? Get another sample. Yeah, well, because yeah, but make sure there's no crystals or anything like that. But read the read the uh, thing. So what I like doing is I don't like shaking like this because in the past this has popped out of my hand and fell on the floor. Now these things are like are are like they're not glass anymore. They're like this high tensile plastic, but there's a potential for cracking. And also, just like anything. Anything ends up on the floor, you can't use it. There's no five second rule in medicine. So, <laughs> how many nurses, how many doctors I've seen? Oh, no, this will they look around. They're like, oh, this is okay. And then they just sterilize the top. No, you, you can't. That's a point source of infection. You can't do that. Right? So, I did that. And what I'd like to do is, like, if I have to shake it, I swirl it around. This is like my own technique. I put it right here on my go like So it doesn't go nowhere. Because if I like this, you know, your gloves, you could be slippery, you could slip on your hand. It's just my little thing. Right, and also it's something I did when I was in the ambulance because how many times in the ambulance you're like, right? you got to give them freaking composine or something really important to calm them down. You're like, Mr. Jones, I'm not the devil, and you're like, yeah, and right. Oh my God, it's always Satan. They always think you're Satan, like uh, the psychotics. Like you're the devil. Don't touch me. So let's say I had to do five C's, five CCs. The first thing I got to do is like do this. I check this. It's good, right? You have to because you don't know how long this thing was on the shelf, right? Now, it goes, I only pull this out when I need it. And you see here, where was my, did I throw away the, son of a beehive. Did I throw away the plastic? Because you see this, this is how you open it. You open it like this, like a, uh, like a banana. Now, what I like doing is, is since this area here isn't sterile, I open it like a banana and I let like the majority of it like stick out like this. So you now have a sterile boat where this can go. So I like doing like that. So now I'm ready to put the five cc's. We're not gonna put five cc's because this, th this thing is a squirter. I'm just gonna just put a little just to show you like how, how it goes in. But if I was gonna do five c's, I take, take this out. I, I do this, right? Make sure it works. Then, I put it down to the five marker, right? To the five cc marker. And this is called charging the bottle. Now, there's a technique on how to do this. Do you see how I'm doing this with my hands? So that if someone knocks me around or the patient grabs at me, it, this thing will still be in the air. Because if I do it like this, how, whoa, poke, poke, poke. That's not good. So you do it like this. And with the bottle, of course, upside down like this. Then once it goes in, right, I push 
that five cc's in. That's called charging the bottle. Then I do what? Then I slowly bring it down to beyond the five cc's. So let's pretend I, I did it beyond the five cc's, right? Now, why do I do it a little bit more than the five cc's? Because if you look right here, there's a little bubble and that'll eat up some volume because the doctor told me it has to be five c's, five cc's, not less, not 4.9, not 4.8. So you can do a little bit more than you would, right? Now, I take it out. And just like TV, you do this. You tap it to make all, see how the bubbles, how the bubbles will go up. And then now it'll go end up in the dead space. Then that's why I do it a little bit from five cc's and then what? Of course, don't do this above your patient or near your patient's eye. I've done that a couple of times, right? So let me get rid of some of this. Let's, let's say I got rid of all of it. So I have what I want. I checked it. I have the five rights, right? I have this, right? All the way down to the five cc's. This thing's already dry. So what do I do? Now on the handout that I'm gonna give you, right? There's areas where you can do an intramuscular injection, either on the right side of your arm, which is your deltoid, right? In the muscular part, or you could also do it in your upper outer region of your buttocks, right? Which is a nice way of saying your derriere, your backside. And why the upper outer area? Does anyone know why the upper outer area? Why can't I poke you like in the middle of your butt cheek or no, towards, uh, towards the center of your butt cheek? There's, there's veins. Yep, there's all, that's good. But what's bigger than a vein? that's huge in your butt. It is your, thank you, bingo, on the nose, right? Sciatic nerve. This is metal. If you put this in your sciatic nerve, you're gonna watch the patient jump and hit the ceiling. I've done it and they did and they kicked me and it's not good, right? So the upper outer, right? And there's some schools of thought they like doing this, like pressing it, but you're gonna go deep anyway. So what I like doing is you hold it like a dart. And then when you go in, you go this slow, you go this slow, ow, 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 that's no, right? This is what I like doing. It goes, okay, take a deep breath. I'm gonna go in three and then I just go. Now, before you go in, you also mentioned there could be a vein, there could be an artery. So I have to aspirate just a little bit I'm gonna look at the dead space, and if there's blood, guess what? Stop, I'm out, right? Discard or find another, uh, find another uh, spot. But let's say I went in, doop, I check, no, no blood, then what will I do? Push, and push fast, and then out, just as quick. Now, there's also something also called a Z-track method. Because if you notice, if I poke you all the way straight down, right? And remember the needle has to be at least an inch so it can get to the muscular area, right? It's usually an inch, inch and a half, right? There's a direct connection between the skin and your muscle. Therefore, don't you think some bacteria might be able to go in? And also if some bacteria and some inflammation and infection goes in, uh, you might have you know, redness and soreness more than you usually would. So there's something called the Z-track method in order to kind of close up the hole so it doesn't go all the way straight up to the skin. Because if you just did it just this normal method, you guys know that when I pull out, there's gonna be a hole that will go straight down into your muscle. And it's gonna give irritation, might get some inflammation. So they invented this thing called the Z-track method. So what you do is you, you kind of hold down the skin like this. And you see I'm pulling on the top parts of the skin, right? Then I go in, check the blood, no blood, down, and then, right, out, and then I draw back. Now, when I draw back, it pushes the skin back and it forms like a Z. So that now the drug will stay where? Inside, and it won't go right up back up the well. So you're pulling the skin taut, and that's why some people like doing like that. But I like doing like this. You grab one end and you go like that, and then I go, uh, I do it like this. I go boom, I check for blood, nope, boom, boom, down, out, and then let go. So Z-track method, think intramuscular, intramuscular, 90 degrees, right? 
straight down because it has to get into the muscle. Now, what do we typically give? We typically give vaccines, uh, intramuscular. We can also give vitamins because uh, many times the patient, um, especially if they have GI effects or uh, a poor first pass effect with their liver, um, just eating the um, you know supplement pills isn't enough. So it's better that we give them the vitamins um, or certain medications with this. And then of course, at the very end, what do you do, right? Sharps. Oh. All right, so that is intramuscular, okay? 90 degrees down, and uh, I'll have a chart uh, having all of this, right? Now, the next one is um, uh, subcutaneous. Now, typically subcutaneous is done with this kind of needle. This is called the tuberculin syringe, also known as an insulin syringe. And uh, it's a very small gauge needle. Uh, I'll take it out so you can see. Look how tiny that is, right? And it doesn't have to go very far. And subcutaneous, you're going down. Don't recap like I just did. Because once you take the cap off, you have to party. You got to go use it. So, and if you'll notice, especially if it's insulin, you say 10, 20, 30, 40. That is units of insulin, right? This is not cc's, right? Because this tuberculin syringe slash insulin syringe is one whole cc, and it's um, it's uh, divided up into ten equal parts, which is one hundred units, and that's how. Um, that's how we deliver insulin. And insulin is typically subcutaneous, right? So we're going at a 45 degree angle. So we don't want to be all the way deep, but we want to, you know, get where? Sub Q. What's in our sub Q? What's in our subcutaneous layer? A lot of fat. Bingo, right? So there's a lot of fat. So this is a, because we want it to be in places where there's a lot of fat. And what's one place? Your tummy, right? And also, it's a good place because it's got a lot of places that we can inject on multiple times. And that's why we like this for uh, subcutaneous. So the same thing applies, right? Let's say I was ordered, um, I gotta take this cap off. Let's say I was ordered um, uh, 20 cc's, right? I check it, right? Of course, I swab this earlier. I have my technique like this. I push into 20. Right? And then I draw 20. Well, let's just pretend I do 20. Now, when I go in, right? Just like a dart, but now my dart will be what? 45 degree angle. And then, since I'm going to subcutaneous, are there arteries and veins in the subcutaneous? Whoa, yes. yes, right? Remember the picture yeah. from anatomy and physiology? Uh, There's red and blue things yeah. in the subcutaneous. So I have to do what? Check. No blood, then what? Push, right? And then out. And you see, you go uh, quickly, uh, quickly in, quickly out. And then discard in the shots. So subcutaneous, 45 degrees. We like it here in the lower abdominal quadrants, right? It's a... Uh, it's a nice place. There are other places, but that's my favorite favorite spots because you know there's a lot of padding there and uh, it's less discomfort for your patient. Last is intradermal. Now, intradermal, and this is why this is also called a tuberculin syringe. Intradermal. Let's say we went through all the other things, right? Now, the intradermal that's for um, um, either TB testing or some sort of uh, what do you call that? Um, um, autoimmune testing, like you know, like if you have allergy testing. Remember the prick test and the rast test from uh, from MED 140. No, you guys are looking at me like, oh. but that's all right. Just review. Just know that I did lecture that. So now I do the same thing, right? And you're not going to be asked to put a lot. You're going to be asked to barely put like 10. Uh, it'll be very very small. So I'm gonna test, I'm gonna charge it. I oh, did the wrong technique. I'm gonna charge it, push, pull out what I need. Tap out bubbles. 
Now, this time, you're going at a very, very shallow angle, less than 15 degrees. So when I'm doing this, you can see here, I'm going like almost flat to the skin. You see how I'm like, now, the function of this is, I'm gonna try to create a bubble. It's called a wheel, W-H-E-A-L. So I go like this, and then I slowly push. Now, this is the one that we go slow, because I wanna try to create the bubble. So let's say, for example, right, right there, I created a bubble. Now, the other techniques, you can like rub it or, uh, you know, put a Band-Aid on it or whatever. But this technique, since I want to create the bubble, what do I now have to do, right? Wait till it dries off a little bit and uh, either take a picture of it uh, with a ruler next to it or a lot of places, draw a circle. But you got to document it, right? What I like doing is, Right, uh, here's another technique as well. You can, uh, oops. right, here's that wheel, right? I could do it like this, so I know how big it is. Take a photograph of it, and then now I have documentation on how big this wheel is. Because if you're taking a TB test, and one of the places, the place that we like to do a lot of allergy testing is here the volar surface on the arm. We could also do it in the intrascapular area if we're doing a lot of them. That's in between the uh, middle of your back, in between your shoulder blades. That's the intrascapular area. But here, the volar surface of the arm, and you guys know the TB test, right? I put antibodies in there, and if you if you have antibody, I mean antigen in there, if you have uh, tuberculosis or antibodies for tuberculosis, what will happen? In 24 hours you'll get a reaction. Like, like, for example, you put this little wheel on me that's about what, I'm looking at it, two, three millimeters. Um, positive is anything like greater than five or six. Since I lived in the Philippines for a while and I also worked with the World Health Organization for two years um, dealing with uh, tuberculosis patients, guess what mine is? Mine turns bright red and it's like nine uh, millimeters, almost a centimeter, because why? This is a screening test. It shows that you have antibodies, right? So back in the day when I, uh, when, uh, when I came home from uh, medical missions, I had to carry a, um, a chest x-ray to prove that I didn't have TB. It's one of the actually nice things about COVID, since everyone's wearing a mask and keeping away from each other, tuberculosis has gone down significantly in Southeast Asia because people are keeping away from each other because more of COVID. Uh, because that's TB is definitely airborne. Remember, COVID is what? Not really airborne, it is a direct contact. So that's why we glove up, we stay away from each other, we try, like, and that's why I'm you know, trying to finish up this lab before 11 and it's around 11. So that's the three methods. I, I, I think I have a hand up, but if I'm not, I'll, I'll put it up today. Anybody online have any questions? Anybody on the ground have any questions? And ladies, there's uh, material here for those of you who are on the ground. Uh, you can uh, you can stay and practice. And I just suggest that you know do one of each, right? And and try it out. And uh, and then after that, um, we can go. So I have the two students who are here. So with that being said, ladies, thank you very much. You're online. You will have credit for today, and you got to you, you got to watch the show. And uh, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm gonna log off. Are we good? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good have one, a good ladies. One. All right, you too. Bye. Bye.